Uh, welcome, everyone. So lovely to see all of you here. And uh, I'm Wynne Fricke, and it's a, a pleasure tonight to introduce uh, Steve Armstrong and Kamala Masters. And I know many of you in um, this group and in our community have studied with Steve and Kamala. Um, they've been coming to the Twin Cities since the early 90s, offering retreats through the Twin Cities Vipassana Collective. and. Um, their senior teachers in the Theravada tradition of Buddhism you know, across the world. And we're so fortunate to have been beneficiaries of their, their great practice and their close ties to teachers like Sayada Upandita and Sayada Utejaniya. And um, it's just a thrill to have uh, both of you here tonight. And uh, I, before I forget, I want to mention that they are offering again another retreat, this time on Zoom. Uh, June 10th through 13th, and there's still space in that retreat. So um, I highly recommend that as a time to deepen into your practice if you have that time. I'll turn it over to you, Stephen Kamala. Okay, thank you. We want to thank you all for uh, joining us, and it's lovely to connect with our family in Minneapolis. And, and more than that, I see other people here from other parts. So uh, Welcome, and we're honored to be here. Thanks for yeah. the invitation. Yes, <laughs> nice to see you. What we're going to do today is to have some time for sitting, and then Steve and I are going to each talk a little bit about our relationship to taking refuge, taking refuge in uh, the Buddha, taking refuge in the Dhamma, taking refuge in the Sangha. And uh, we thought to uh, we thought to give some reflections about this because today is Vesak Day, and it's the day of the celebration of the Buddha's birth, uh, the enlightenment, and also uh, the Parinibbana, the um, beyond death <laughs> uh, experience of the Buddha. So it's very important day for uh, many of us traditionally, and there might be some ways if, if there's not a connection uh, for you personally in terms of the, the lineage, the tradition, then we want to give some heart words, heart words from our heart about what that means to us so that it can come down in common ground, as we say. So Steve is going to start us off with um, some sitting meditation, about 30 minutes of it. He'll guide us and uh, we'll sit together. Thank you all for uh, showing up. It's nice to have the opportunity on this auspicious day to uh, acknowledge to us the value of the life of the Buddha, birth, awakening, and passing away. So let's just take a few minutes to really reflect on the teaching of the Buddha in our life. And we'll sit in silence with minimal instruction to pour point our hearts towards the awakening of the Buddha and our own possibility. So in sitting, to awaken the attention, we can sometimes Tend to the body, how you are sitting, how you feel in the body, checking that you're not tight and tense, but you're not too loose or too relaxed. Finding that place in the middle where we're attentive and at ease with our body and our mind. In this way, we can naturally 
recognize the present moment's experience. We don't need to force or push or try to get something, but really to settle into the present moment's experience. Experiencing the body is like this. Feeling the sensations in the body. Maybe the changing sensations in the breath, the nostrils, the belly, the chest. Just attending to the present moment experience of the body, how it is for you. Letting your body relax and letting your mind be alert to notice what the body feels like. and to acknowledge that there's awareness of it. The awareness of the body, the awareness of hearing and understanding the instructions, aware of your own experience in the body, in your mind, your heart. Really, we're connecting with the present moment, the body, the heart, the mind. You may be familiar with the noting of your experience that when you breathe in, you know you're breathing in. When you breathe out, you know you're breathing out. Or if you're attending to the recognition of the knowing mind, the awareness, just know that, recognize that. So we're not trying to make anything happen so much as just noticing what is already happening in the body, in the mind, in the environment around you, hearing sounds, feeling the temperature, being present for the full experience of the body mind at this time. So we're not trying to make something happen. We're not looking for an experience, a particular kind of experience. Just recognizing that there is a clear experience being known. Hearing, breathing, sitting, and what's going on in the mind, paying attention, connecting with the present moment experience, and sustaining your attention on the present moment experience.
you may find it helpful to note or to name your experience. Like breathing in and feeling that. Breathing out, feeling that. And if the recognition of this experience is clear, you can know knowing clarity. Whatever your descriptive word of what you experience at this time. When you recognize you've forgotten to pay attention, begin again. The activity of beginning again is necessary practice, habit to get into. without any agenda, you'll be noticing a range of things in the body, in the mind, in the environment, Just knowing and acknowledge that. I'll quiet, be, quiet, <laughs> be quiet now and let you establish your own continuity.
When you notice that you've been lost in thought or drifting, just begin again. Connecting with the present moment's experience, sustaining your attention, recognize it. This is the work of practice.
Thank you everyone for your practice. It's lovely to sit together. One of the benefits and the silver linings of, of this time where usually um, we wouldn't be gathering together, but now we're able to connect through the, the miracles that we have nowadays. for a lot of people who practice the Dharma. And uh, <clears throat> wanted to talk about today taking refuge. I realized, we both realized how much strife there is in the world today. A lot of chaos and confusion. There's so many intersecting crises that are happening all over the world and in our own hometowns. I, I think about all of you in Minneapolis a lot because we hear a lot about what's going on there in the news and um, my heart's with you. Our hearts are with you, always there. There's a lot of um, change going on and change brings pain. We need to find a refuge, a place where we can go to, to settle our minds and our hearts and our bodies so that we can take a breather from all of what's happening around us and just connect with something, hopefully deep inside the strength, the clarity, the balance to deal with all these situations in our lives on the national world level, community level, and within our own families. I didn't mention in the beginning that um, Steve and I are speaking and living and breathing the air from the unceded land of the Hawaiian people. Uh, we live on Maui. And while I was sitting here, I was thinking of the place of refuge on the big island. And uh, it's, I think it's called a city of refuge. There's a Hawaiian name for it, but that's the, the, the place of refuge is what I know. And in times past, the Hawaiian people would be able to go there no matter what, uh, as long as they were. I was talking about uh, the place of refuge, finding that place in our own hearts so that we can from there, um, find a place where we can have some balance, some ease, some clarity in order to reconnect with the world. And so what our practice is all about is that, you know, finding a place of refuge where we can go to during these challenging times. In the teachings of the refuges, uh, there is a taking refuge in the Buddha, taking refuge in the Dhamma, taking refuge in the Sangha. So I just wanted to fill that out a little more uh, for us in kind of everyday terms, more down to earth, um, what that means to me personally and to a lot of people I know in the Dharma. Taking refuge in the Buddha was not the easiest one for me in the beginning. Um, I was raised in a Catholic and a uh, Christian tradition. And so what I was looking for, even from that tradition, is some understanding. And uh, I wasn't looking for, you know, a, a, a person or a, a, an idol to go to, somebody that, you know, would be the teacher, but to understand something and to understand for myself. So first, I was more connected to the Dharma, to learning what the Dharma meant and how it connected to my life and how I could develop these ways and means in connection with awareness, in connection with like the four um, 
divine emotions of loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. Those meant a lot to me. And as I was in the understanding of the Dharma more and more, doing the practice of Vipassana or insight meditation, doing the practices of loving kindness, for example, uh, I, I was able to connect more to that first uh, taking refuge in the Buddha. One way I was able to connect was the fact that I was able to um, to really understand, like in the in the Buddha's life, I understood more deeply that the Buddha was a human being, just like myself. And what that human being's quest was, was to find the truth of life and to really live in alignment with that, to know that deeply within, to live in alignment with that. So as I came to understand that more and more, my connection, uh, my similar connection of being a human being and the purpose of this human being's life was to be totally aware, just so completely deeply aware of everything that's going on, that there was no pulling back or no turning away, no pushing away, no ignorance, no delusion about it, a complete acceptance of who I am as a human being and understanding that deeply and being able to purify the mind and the heart of the ways that uh, worked against that greed, hatred, and delusion, to be able to purify the mind and heart from that. This is what I really connected to in terms of having uh, the ability, the capacity to gain what this human being did, was to gain that kind of liberation that kind of purification. That was my connection with the Buddha, that just like myself, he was a human being. And it, it, it didn't matter to me what gender, where he came from. It was the teachings that kind of connected me to that. So when I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the fact that just like myself, there was a lot of suffering and there was a lot of pain to understand what's going on beneath the surface of things. And a lot of, um, a lot of ability to stay with what's difficult and to go beyond that. So that was my uh, connection. And when I take refuge in the Buddha, what I'm taking refuge in really is my own capacity for that complete awareness and that uh, capacity for liberation. Taking refuge in the Dhamma are taking, is taking refuge in the truth, taking refuge in how things are. And uh, in my practice, I've done that more on a level of this moment, taking refuge in the truth of this moment, moment after moment after moment. And from doing that, I've been able to take refuge in understanding deeper truths, deeper understandings of the Dharma, like the Four Noble Truths, like the Seven Factors of Enlightenment, like the Five Hindrances and the Dependent Origination, and it goes on and on, all the numbers that we hear about of the teachings. Able to verify that for myself, taking refuge in the Dhamma, taking refuge in the truth, starting out with the truth of this moment. And then taking refuge in the Sangha, which means all of you taking refuge in this community that really helps me to stay with it. That's really kind of like the nearest thing to me on a daily level. So I revere all of that. I take refuge in all of that. And I hope that you can Feel in your own ways, uh, in the same way, in similar ways. So hand it over to Steve now, and um, maybe you can say a little bit about your story, Steve. Yeah, thank you, Kamala. Uh, you're reminding me of 
my introduction to the teachings of the Buddha. You know, and like many of you maybe had no idea of the profundity and the scope of what the Buddha was talking about and how he guided others in life. But like many of you stumble along and seemingly by accident, we end up somehow with a good teacher, with some good understanding and a little bit of fledgling uh, faith, we begin practice. And it doesn't take long to realize that, wow, there's a whole other way of life than what I have been conditioned by in my own personal life. And that's not to dismiss or put aside personal family, social conditioning. We all do that. We all have that. And we all have to establish some stability within that. But there's so much in our life that doesn't kind of isn't addressed by our career, our checkbook, our car. And it's those qualities of the heart that sometimes just not recognized, not valued even, then what is visible and what is on, in the headlines of our life. And so through practice, I have discovered that, wow, there's a whole, there's a whole superstructure of what I'm living with and from. And it has been enlivened and expanded by my practice of the Dharma. And so my, my taking refuge in the Dharma has expanded to just Wow, everything is a lesson. It's not a slam dunk. It's not a test. It's not anything. It's just like, okay, can I be with this? And what's it all about to me? You know, because in the end, or maybe all along the way, it's how does it affect here, my own heart? And it's not what's in the books, and it's not what, you know, neighbors or other people that you know who are associated with it with the dharma but what's going on in our own heart as we come to know this more and more through mindful awareness which is remembering to recognize the present moment it's so simple to understand to remember to recognize the present moment and as simple as it is, it's really challenging to establish a continuity of that. And yet that's where all of our liberating understanding, tranquility of mind, the compassionate heart comes from this awakening to the present moment. When I first had been practicing, I didn't really understand that it had anything to do with the Buddha, <laughs> you know, and, you know, like probably many of us, I was not a scholar and didn't know anybody who was, you know, uh, a, a Buddhist, a Buddhist teacher. But as I went on, I began to grow in appreciation of like, oh, there's something going on here that's, you know, some instruction and guidance that's different than my car, my credit card, and uh, my career, and it's what is in the heart. And that awakening of the heart and letting that be the refuge of my life, that has been the most valuable and distinguishing characteristic of my relationship with the Dharma. And just to bring you up to the present, we'll say the present time, uh, as many of you know, I uh, 
three years ago, I was diagnosed with a terminal uh, brain cancer. And um, when it was diagnosed and uh, had a very quick uh, surgery of my, in my brain, and my doctor asked me, do you know one, do, would you like to know what's going on? And I said, oh yeah, I, I wanna know what's going on. He said, well, you have glioblastoma, you've got four months to live. And if we do everything we possibly can, and what we know might be helpful, you might have 15 months. I tell you, that's a wake up call. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, it's like, it just, everything just got pulled out from underneath what I had established for the stability in my life. My car, my credit card, my career, career second, gone. And I was less left with just this present moment. What am I doing with it? What's it doing to me? Can I live with this experience? And in the including in, in uh, ensuing three years now, uh, my doctors have you know, confirmed that uh, you're way beyond the expected life expectancy and you're in the outlier range and everything from here on is well, seemingly just luck. And, you know, we'd like to have more assurance than just luck, but nevertheless, and we do so much of our life trying to establish what we want, how we want it, and find it almost intolerable not to get what we want. Hello. <laughs> Sometimes things like this happen, and what are the resources we have to deal, to deal with, to accommodate the understanding, this immediate understanding that time is all you have. And if you're aware, you experience the time, and if you're not, you miss it. And this is the value of our practice. It's like, it's trying, it's practicing to be present moment to moment, whether we like it or not, whether it's pleasant or not, that's not the issue. The issue is, are you aware? Do you recognize the present moment, pleasant or unpleasant? That's not the goal. The goal is, am I aware? Is awareness happening? And how as is my mind relating to it? Because that is the establishment of authenticity, understanding, compassion. When we're that in touch with the fragility of life, there's no time. It's just now. You can't plan for anything in the future. That's it, you know, we're just here, all of us in this present moment, alive, aware, relating to the full catastrophe, so to speak. This is the way it is in life. having been introduced to mindful awareness and the Buddha's understanding of the Dharma has been the key for me of uh, waking up to the present moment. That's freedom. That's liberation. So thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm. And I hope it can uh, inspire you in your own practice of being present for your life. Thank you, Steve. Thank you all for that um, listening and, and being patient with the bumpiness <laughs> of <laughs> connections here.
just like to take the last uh, time of our being together to answer any questions you may have. Um, and I think, um, Gwen, would you direct us in this, like how you do this part? Do you do the hand raise part or? Um, you know, I think uh, we're small enough, maybe um, if someone has a question, they can just unmute themselves. That will probably work. Or, or raise a hand and I can call too. So either way. Okay. So you might uh, have not just a question, but a just a comment or um, where your your connection with the Buddha Dhamma Sangha is in your life. Don't be shy. <laughs> for a long time in my own practice, I didn't understand where this was coming from. This understanding of the Dharma and awareness. I didn't know it was just something I did, you know, meditation. But underneath that is a powerful momentum of awakening and understanding that I had never been introduced to. And by practicing, of course, to come in to not only just know it, but to live it. And that is the liberating dimension of it. Yeah, I have something right on the tip of my tongue, so I'll, I'll speak first, okay? Um, one of the things that I, I agree with you, Patrice, and also I see that very much in my own life, that the relational really uh, brings up for me what's going on in my own heart in relationship to uh, what's going on out there. And so the relational part of life to me is really important in terms of discovering what's going on in my heart. For example, maybe places where uh, there's some limitations or there's some hindrances there that actually need to be known and purified um, by knowing them, first of all, and then by acting in ways that kind of go the opposite of that hindrance. For example, just an example in life uh, that I was speaking about on, I guess it was this group on Monday or um, uh, on, on Zoom, was the fact of, um, being able with the practice to understand what I still have to purify in my life, in my heart, and um, to be able to uh, recognize the goodness and the, the ability of my own heart to not just be in that hindrance. So a, an example of that is how I might go about in my day and I experience this here in my own life too, as you do, all of you do, when I meet somebody who has opinions about the political system or the um, a kind of lack of understanding about racial injustice, and I develop, I in my own heart, what comes up is aggravation, aversion, uh, attachment to my own way of looking at it and i try to remember the the buddha's words on um remembering the goodness you know of turning your heart towards the goodness and that's what you were talking about patrice about knowing those four what i call divine emotions loving kindness um, compassion sympathetic joy and equanimity every situation in life can be can have the medicine of one of those when you know it's difficult in life um when i have aversion towards way away somebody speaking about something that isn't in agreement with my viewpoint i i'm aware of what's going on here that is really important and relationally i can be grateful for that person bringing that up in my own heart. So I can wait for a while and then I can turn my attention to something that's uh, wise or compassionate 
to to respond with so both of those the relational and the kind of introspective come together it's not that it's all one way it it needs to be an understanding that both are working circularly but if we're not knowing where we're coming from we're basically just going to always respond with habit so relational is really important and nowadays it's important to me to realize that my path is not yet finished you know i've got a lot of ways that i can bring awareness here and turn it towards something else in relationship to the world so i hope that works for now <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah both are important at the same time even yeah you can reflect is there ever a day goes by when of course things happen and it's not always what we want to experience but can we welcome that whoever is involved with that same quality that we would open to a best friend i know that uh, there's a lot of uh, i guess you say political strife in, in our country and other countries, we're most connected uh, of what's going on in Burma. And that's just, we have a lot of connection and friends and teachers there that, you know, and as we know, it's a lot of suffering there now. But in my practice of loving kindness, when I was a monk in Burma, and there was another uh, uprising in Burma and again the militaries were act was acting out unskillfully and i was doing practice and i switched sw switched from vipassana which is paying attention to everything to practicing loving kindness because there was so much suffering and after i'd been practicing for a couple of weeks my teacher said are you practicing loving kindness for the generals that just took over the country. And I was indignant. I said, you gotta be kidding. No way. <laughs> no way that they're, they're not doing good things. And my teacher widely said, wisely said, you know, they would like to be happy too, but through their ignorance, they don't recognize that what they're doing is not going to lead to happiness wow okay it's not condemning the person condemning the quality of mind that is brutal that is not being kind so can we recognize that and stay present with that in our own heart so did you send meta <laughs> At, at that time, it was 24 hours a day, <laughs> you know, just kind of like keeping at it. And, you know, predictably, it was not easy. But in time, I could see the benefit of practicing even with very difficult people or situations that it addresses my heart in relationship to all of others. Very good. Thank you. Anybody else? And you actually offered something um, very beautiful, you know, just saying how your connection was to uh, Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And I want to point out, highlight the fact that um, different ones of us will connect to one of those more than another. And now with Sangha, you know, and I think for many of us, um in in this covid time sangha has been so important uh connection with one another as patrice also pointed out yeah so thank you for that and for us too you know being very far away from the places we usually go to and uh having the connection with all of you this way and with others on zoom has been so important to us yeah 